Well, the enemy's working overtime to create technical difficulties, but we'll trust that we'll get through these things. <sighs> Let's begin by taking a look at our text, the very familiar one in Philippians chapter 3. And I'd like to read the entire chapter. So listen to what Paul writes, and again, remembering that Paul is not just uh, relaying to us his experiences and his own desires that were just for himself, but he was conveying these things, saying these things to the Philippians <clears throat> to encourage them to do the same thing, because this is what the Lord desired of them as well and what he desires of us. So beginning in verse 1, this is what we read. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, have this attitude, and if anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I have often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Now again, we've, there's many things that Paul tells us in this passage, but we're just going to be looking at um, a few of them uh, this evening. Now, remember this morning, we were looking at how a new heart brings a new direction. Uh, Paul started off hating Jesus Christ. He was the one who volunteered, remember, to watch the coats of the witnesses uh, who stoned Stephen. He was the one who led the attack a against the church of Jerusalem, going from house to house, dragging both men and women to prison. He was the one who traveled 140 miles, uh, one and a half weeks journey north uh, to purge the synagogues of Damascus from the influences of what he considered to be those heretics 
uh, Jewish heretics and to bring them back to Jerusalem in order to stand trial. Unlike uh, Gamaliel, remember, who was much, more, uh, much wiser, much more evenly tempered, who thought that if this work was not of God, that in the end it would essentially end by itself, Paul wanted to end it now. But, again, the Lord changed all of that. Uh, before Paul reached the city, the Lord humbled him by knocking him to the ground, taking away his sight. He allowed Paul to remain blind for three days while he fasted and prayed, perhaps um, reflecting on what it is that, that he had done with his life, where he was going, and, and uh, how he was mistaken regarding Jesus. And when his eyes were finally opened, when Ananias had gained the courage that he needed to go and to pray that Paul might receive his sight, Paul found that he could see in more ways than one. He immediately got up, uh, received the sign of the new covenant, uh, baptism, identified himself with the Lord Jesus Christ, broke his fast, uh, ate to gather his strength, and then he went straight out to the synagogues where before he was going to go and arrest those who belonged to Jesus to drag them back to Jerusalem, he went instead to prove to his Jewish brethren um, that Jesus was in fact the Christ. And so his life was powerfully transformed. It was so, so powerfully that those who previously had been looking forward to his arrival that they might uh, rid themselves of these pesky Christians now wanted to kill Paul as well. And the point is that the new heart that our Lord Jesus Christ gives radically changes our lives. Uh, it puts us on an entirely different path than we were on uh, before. Now, that's what we see, or what we saw actually in um, uh, Acts chapter 9. Uh, what we see in our text this evening is Paul describing to us something more of this change. And essentially, he tells us three things that the new heart gave to him, which of course he will also, or has also given to us. First of all, a new foundation for his acceptance with God. Paul, before as a legalist, trusted his works, but now he trusted Jesus' obedience and his death alone to save him. Uh, new affections. He no longer hated Jesus, but he wanted to know him as intimately as he possibly could. And he gave to Paul a, a new goal that he might strive to attain to the resurrection of the righteous. Now, those are the three things that we want to see this evening, realizing that if we've trusted in Jesus and he's given us a new heart, he has also given to us these things as well. Now, first of all, Paul had a new foundation for his hope of acceptance with God. Instead of looking to what it is that he had done, he looked instead to Jesus. Now here we get a, a bit of review, remember, of what Dr. Ferguson taught us in the series, The Whole Christ, which was about the marrow controversy and what it means to be a legalist, what it means to be an antinomian, what it means to be an evangelical Christian. We need to understand what justification by grace through faith alone means, particularly as we look at the last point, as Paul was striving to attain to the resurrection of the dead, I mean, I think we just, we pretty much take it for granted that we are going to attain it. And we certainly are if we're trusting in Jesus, but again, it requires effort. But, but let's consider this. Paul, while he was a Pharisee, was a legalist. He wasn't looking to God for gracious acceptance. He wasn't trusting in God's Messiah, the Messiah who was coming. He thought Messiah still was coming, but um, he had already come. He wasn't looking forward to the Messiah, trusting in him for salvation. Rather, he was trusting in himself. And we see what it is he was trusting in the earlier verses here of Philippians chapter 3. He was trusting, first of all, in his pedigree, in his lineage, the fact that he was a child of Abraham, that he was a part of the nation of Israel. 
He was trusting in the fact that he had received circumcision. Remember the, the sign of the old covenant, the sign of the <clears throat> Abrahamic covenant, circumcised on the eighth day according to the law. The fact that he was of the tribe of Benjamin, which might be a rather dubious uh, credential, because remember that um, Benjamin had a very checkered past during the days of the judges. They were almost exterminated as a tribe in Israel because of what they had done to the Levites' concubine and because of the uh, ensuing war of the other tribes against that tribe. But it was also the tribe that was later honored by being that tribe from which Israel received their first king, whose name was also Saul. So raised uh, the, perhaps the, the honor of Benjamin a bit. Uh, he, was, he calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews, which doesn't necessarily mean that of all the Hebrews, he sort of stood out among all of the, uh, all of the other Hebrews, uh, but rather that he was a full-blooded um, full Jew. He was a child of two Jewish parents, both a father and a mother, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So he trusted in his pedigree. He was also trusting in his obedience. And this is really what made him a legalist, that he was a Pharisee, that he belonged to the strictest sect of Judaism, that he was not only an expert in the law of God, but he was one who prided himself on keeping that law. And he also trusted in his zeal, the zeal that he thought was for God's glory that led him to destroy those who, in his opinion, had perverted the traditions. Remember the heretics, the Christians. But once his eyes were opened to his real condition before God by this event that took place on the Damascus Road, when he saw that he was really trying to justify himself, uh, basically uh, putting himself, when he, when he saw that by trying to justify himself, he was... You know, where that put him in his relationship with the Lord. And again, he describes that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. When he understood that he was under that curse, when he understood what his works were really in the eyes of God, that they were essentially nothing better than rubbish, which uh, is a word that can be translated trash, refuse, or even dung. When he saw who Jesus really was and what it was that Jesus had to offer him, if he would only put his trust in him, Paul says he threw away all the good that he thought he had done, all the things that he thought he had accomplished, and he received the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us in verses 7 through 9 of Philippians 3, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So Paul essentially saw in that event through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the new heart that was given to him, his condition and his need of the Lord Jesus Christ alone to justify him. Now, the new heart that gives us a new direction changes that direction by giving to us a new side of ourselves, doesn't it? And of the things that we have done. And, of course, gives us a new sight of the Lord Jesus. We see that we can't be good enough. That the harder we try, the more we are going to fail the more we're going to fall, the more we're going to come under his judgment. Uh, John, uh, John Bunyan portrayed this in Pilgrim's Progress when Christian was climbing Mount Sinai. If you'll recall, the higher he got on the mountain, the more it seemed like the mountain was, was as it were, hanging over his head 
and about to fall on him and destroy him. And that's what the law does. The further we go in the law trying to earn our own righteousness, the more it actually condemns us. We see when the Lord opens our eyes that we cannot justify ourselves by our own works. We, can't, we not only can't do that, we also can't keep ourselves in the grace of God once he has justified us by faith, by our obedience, by keeping up a certain level of good works. You know, there are some denominations of Christians that teach us that we're saved by grace through faith, you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you come in, you're his child, but you're only his child as long as you're walking with him in the absolute straight and narrow. And if you step out of line, I mean, this is what Charles Finney actually taught, you step out of line, even just an iota, and you're, you're cast out of the family and you're lost. So he believed that salvation was by grace, but staying in that salvation required works. Well, that too is legalism. We don't save ourselves by our works. We don't keep ourselves saved by our works. We're saved by the grace of Christ alone. Now this, again, is the way of the legalist. If we think this way, it's really no different than the Pharisees. And so the Lord opened our eyes to that, trying to make ourselves good enough, like the rest of the world who believes that if they do enough good works, their good works will outweigh their bad works on the day of judgment and God will accept me. The fact is God won't accept us because even one bad work is enough to miss heaven forever. And so the Lord shows us this and he opens our eyes to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his sacrifice to take away our guilt, to his obedience alone to make us acceptable to God and that he gives that to us by grace alone, and we receive it by faith alone. So this new sight that the new heart gives to us gives us a new direction. First of all, it sends us straight to Jesus in order that we might be justified by him. That was Paul's experience. That's the experience of every true believer. Now, secondly, the new heart also gave Paul new affections. And we saw that this morning. Paul no longer hated Jesus. But he wanted to now to know Jesus as intimately as he possibly could. Now, Paul started out as the one who was leading the charge against Jesus and his church. He was the one who wanted to destroy it. But after Jesus changed his heart and Paul received him in his righteousness, he then began to pursue a new relationship with Jesus Christ, no longer as an adversary, but now as one who loved him. And his only desire was expressed or is expressed in verse 10 that he might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now, this is perhaps the most important part of Philippians chapter 3 because it, it shows us what it is that the new heart will produce within us. It gives us a desire for this kind of relationship. Now, first of all, Paul wanted to know Jesus. Now, you know pretty, I think, fairly well that there are, uh, Greek, Greek is very expressive. It has a number of words that can be translated by the same English word, and each one of them have sort of a nuance. <laughs> each one of them have a certain nuance of meaning. Now, this is not the word that means to learn something or, or to gain some new information, what we usually think of as knowing. Now, Paul certainly wanted to learn things about Jesus. He wanted to know who Jesus is. He wanted to know what Jesus had done. He wanted to know how Jesus had fulfilled the Scriptures. And he wanted to know this not only for himself, but so that he might be able to explain it to others and prove that Jesus is the Christ. But this particular word expresses more of relationship, not wanting to know something, but wanting to know someone. Paul wanted to know Jesus. He wanted to know what Jesus was like. He wanted to know what was pleasing to Jesus so that he could do those things that pleased him so that he could walk with Jesus in a closer way, so that he could walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, that he might have fellowship with him and that he might 
have a closer and more loving relationship with the Lord Jesus. Now, as we go a bit deeper into this particular verse, we see that Paul, Paul's intimacy or the desire of, that he wanted of this relationship was even closer, perhaps, than we ordinarily think. Because you really can't know somebody unless you actually walk in their shoes. I think you've heard that experience before. You never really know what someone is going through unless you're in their shoes. Well, you really can't know Jesus unless you are in his shoes, unless you've experienced the things that Jesus has experienced. And that's what Paul wanted. He wanted to know the power of his resurrection. Jesus knew that power in his own life. Jesus, remember, as Ferguson also pointed out in another series, the Holy Spirit was his, his comforter, his counselor, his companion. He was the one who was anointed with the Spirit above measure. He was the one who empowered the Lord Jesus Christ to do what he did. This was the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. This is the power of that resurrection, that spiritual resurrection, the Spirit that raised Paul to this newness of life. What Paul wanted to know here is he wanted to know that holy influence in his own soul, giving him the heart of his Savior that he might lay down his life for him, even as Jesus laid down his life for his Father. So he wanted to know that power. I think that's something that perhaps we all want to know. We pray for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We're actually commanded to be filled with the Spirit. We want to know that power, that strength, that courage, that victory that the Lord gives to us. We want to, to know that victory over sin. We want to know that sanctification. Well, that's part of what it means to know Jesus, to be filled with His Holy Spirit. But Paul also wanted something that I think most of us here probably do our best to try to avoid, and that is to know the fellowship of His sufferings, to be able to stand in His shoes and to take the abuse that was meant for his Lord, even as his Lord had taken the abuse that was meant for him. I mean, Jesus came into the world to save us. All the abuse that he experienced, he experienced for us when he was on the cross and our sins were laid upon him. The wrath of God that was poured out against him was done for us. Jesus suffered for us. Paul wanted to suffer for him. He wanted to know what that was like. And then lastly, he wanted to be conformed to his death. And I think what he means by that is this, that even as Jesus died to himself, that he might serve his Father, where he took up his cross in order to serve the Lord, even to the point of giving up his life, that Paul might also take up his cross, that he might lay down his life for his Lord. Now, when we walk in our Lord's shoes when we live as He lived, when we are filled with His Holy Spirit, when we're willing to suffer for His cause, and we actually do suffer for it, when we are so completely surrendered to the Lord and in, in basically surrendering ourselves into His hands that we're content to live or to die for Him, that's when we really know the Lord Jesus. That's when, uh, well, that's when we know Him in the way Paul wanted to know Him. And essentially, that is what we want as believers. Sometimes it's, it's helpful to be able to identify the new affections that are in our hearts so that we can know what direction it is we're going to go. But we know in our heart of hearts, if we believe to the Lord Jesus Christ, if our hearts have been changed by His grace, we want exactly the same thing. We want to know Jesus. We don't want to know him perfectly, otherwise we would be going that direction perfectly. There is a struggle that's going on in our hearts, but our true desire, the real us, the new us, is the one that wants to know Jesus in this way. Now finally, the new heart that Jesus gave to Paul also gave him a new goal, and that goal was the resurrection. That, that goal may actually be many things. It can certainly be serving the Lord Jesus, trying to further his church, glorify his name in this world and all the fruitful labor he might do to him. But he really summarizes it for us in verse 11 when he says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, he, he says in verse 10, 
that he wanted to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that he may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So he wanted to have this intimate, this deep relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, not only because he loved him, but also because he wanted to be a part of the resurrection of the righteous from the dead. Now, we might ask the question, wasn't Paul already a part of this resurrection because he trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Wasn't it guaranteed to him? Well, yes, it was, as a matter of fact. Everyone who trusts in Jesus is a part of that resurrection or will be a part of that resurrection in the future. But I think what he's expressing here is what is also true of everyone who really trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is they will pursue the Lord Jesus. To know him and to experience his life in their life, they will pursue perfection. Now, not just the perfection that comes from having the righteousness of Jesus credited to our account, imputed to us that alien righteousness that Luther talked about, by which alone we are justified. That's what we need, of course, to be saved. But he was talking here about the practical perfection that we are all called to as believers, that we might be like Jesus. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48? And he means this the way he says it. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's what the heart of every true believer is, to be like him. Now, what does it mean to be like your heavenly Father, to be perfect? It means to be like Jesus because he is exactly like the Father. He's the one who explains him. He's the one who reveals him. The new heart that Jesus gives us gives us the desire to be perfect as he is perfect. And that is the reason why we go in the new direction that we go. This desire, when we go in this direction and we see ourselves going in this direction, this is what shows us that we will in fact be a part of that resurrection. Sometimes it almost sounds like uh, Paul, you know, he wants to make sure he's not deceiving himself. That he thinks he's a true believer, but he really isn't. He buffets his body and he makes it his slave so that he would not, after preaching to others, be cast away. He realized that if he was a true believer, certain things had to be true of him. And one of those is this pursuit of perfection. Now, did Paul believe it was possible to be perfect on this side of heaven? Well, obviously not. He didn't believe in perfectionism. Here's another verse we can use against the idea of perfectionism in verse 12, but let me just point out that even though it wasn't possible, he still pursued it as though it was possible. He says this, not that I have already obtained it, that is this perfection, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Jesus has taken hold of us so that we might become like him. And becoming like him is the whole package. Everything that Paul did was to be like Jesus. All of his evangelism, all of his self-sacrifice, all of his service, all of that was to be like Jesus. So he wanted to lay hold of that likeness because that is why Jesus took hold of him. Now think about this for a minute. If you aim lower than that standard, if you aim lower than perfection, you're going to very likely hit lower than you feasibly could. But if you aim high, you will likely hit higher. You're not going to hit the mark. None of us are going to hit the mark because we cannot be like Jesus on this side of heaven, but we will aim high. We will aim at that. Now, the Lord wants us to aim that high. He wants us to aim for perfection. He wants us, notice what Paul also says, he wants us to forget what it is we've done in the past, either the past sins that we're ashamed of, or maybe the past accomplishments that we think we have attained, and he wants us to continue to strive forward. We have not obtained perfection. Forget what lies behind and continue to run forward, continue to strive forward towards perfection as those who are running in such a way 
that we may win. In our text, Paul also uses that same analogy that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says in verses 13 and 14, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He doesn't sit on his laurels, on his past accomplishments, but he keeps moving forward. And think about that for a minute. That's the only way to make progress, isn't it? Is to move forward, continually moving forward. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Keep pressing on toward Christ like those who are trying to win the prize. And that we might know, of course, that this is something that the Lord wants all of us to do and not just a personal goal of Paul. He says in verse 15, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And that word perfect there means mature, those who see what they should see, see the way they should see. As many as have this view, he says, let, let them have this attitude. That's the attitude that we need to have. And if, anything, if, if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. In other words, the Lord will show you your fault, my fault, if we are aiming at anything less than perfection. And again, how can we be? If we want to know the Lord Jesus, that's how we know him. He is perfect. So justification, God's accepting us as righteous, comes through faith in the Lord Jesus alone through the work that he has done alone, the, 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 the new site shows us that that is the case. But again, this faith that justifies, that the Spirit gives to us freely, makes us want to know Jesus, makes us want to be perfect like Jesus. This is the new direction that the new heart that God gives us will take us. And so again, this evening, let's just take a step back and look at ourselves and ask, is this the direction that we're going? Are we trusting Jesus alone for our justification? Do we really want to know him? I mean, really want to know him the way that Paul wanted to know him. Do we want that kind of intimacy, to have that power and to experience his sufferings, to walk in his shoes, to walk where Jesus walked? And are we striving towards perfection that we might attain to the resurrection of the righteous as an athlete trying to win uh, the prize. Well, if we do, then we have the new heart that the Lord has given to the Apostle Paul that he gives to all of his children who trust in him. Well, may the Lord grant that we may see that uh, in our lives. And if not, we might turn to Jesus that he would give us such a heart. Let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us apply this.